Hello everybody, Justin Miller, Rockstar College Physics. We're gonna be looking at some more work. And what we're gonna do today is look at some work done by both conservative and non-conservative forces acting at the same time. So what we wanna do is just kind of get down how we would approach a problem that has both conservative and non-conservative forces acting. So let us just go ahead and do that. So we know some things. So let us just put something up here first. Work done by conservative and non-conservative forces. So for general, in general, we have that the net work done does what? Right, produces the change in kinetic energy, delta K E. Nice work energy theorem there. So what can we do with this? Well, if we have both conservative and non-conservative forces acting, we could add up the works that they do, right? So let W sub C be the work done by conservative forces. UNC be the work done by non-conservative forces. So what can we write? Well, if we can kind of generalize this. Now, if we have both non-conservative and conservative forces acting, we have that the net work done can be written as the sum of the work done by the conservative and work done by the conservative forces. That seems pretty simple. So we'll do W sub C plus W sub MC. And what do we know? Um, doing capital and lowercase, I keep that lowercase. Just like there, W sub MC. Well, we know that in general, the net work done produces the change in kinetic energy. So this is ultimately what sums up to produce the change in kinetic energy. Well, there's something nice about work done by conservative forces in that they can be recast in terms of changes in potential energy. For conservative forces, we have that W sub C is equal to negative delta PE. We recast the change in potential energy in terms of the negative of the work done, or vice versa, negative side of it. Any negative work done is really positive change in potential energy, stored energy. And positive work done is the release of that potential energy. Eh, yeah, we'll just see. What Anyways, what can we do there? Well, we can replace this with a negative delta PE. So now we've got the net work done is equal to the negative of the change in the potential energy of the system plus the work done by non-conservative forces and those two add together to produce the overall change in kinetic energy. Well, let us rewrite that slightly. I'm gonna go ahead and throw the delta PE on the other side and write this out like this. Now we have Delta Ke plus Delta Pe is equal to the work done by the non-conservative forces. Look at that. The change of kinetic energy plus the change of potential energy of the system must equal the work done by the non-conservative forces. Oh, that's it. What happens if there's no non-conservative forces acting? That's equal to zero and we have conservation of total mechanical energy. If there are non-conservative forces doing work, then well, we have that the total change in energy is equal to whatever work that they do. If it's something like friction, that's always going to be negative. They're always, it's always taking away energy in the system, taking away mechanical energy, transforming it in other forms. But we can have some applied force that's increasing the overall energy in the system. And in that case, we'd have that the total change in energy is, well, some positive value. 
So that's really it. This is what we end up with. And what we want to do now is go ahead and take a little problem, take a nice little look at this, and apply it. So we're going to do a couple problems here. First one, pretty straightforward. Second one, a little bit more complex, but that's usually what we do anyway. So let us just roll out the problem here, shall we? Here it is. All right, so we are going to go ahead and take ourselves a 0.5 kilogram mass, hold it at rest against a compressed spring where the spring constant of that spring is 125 newtons per meter. And we're gonna say that the spring is initially compressed by 12 centimeters. initially at rest, the initial is equal to zero, and then we're going to release it. And part A, we're just going to say it's frictionless, and part B, we're going to say there's actually some friction going on. So part A, frictionless. What speed does the mass leave the spring? Well, in that particular case, if it's frictionless and this is a horizontal surface, we've got ourselves a conservative system and we have that any potential energy that's initially stored in the spring is released into the mass. So simply, we have ourselves that delta PE sub S is equal to negative delta KE. That is fine to write out like that. We can expand this out and say that PE sub S final minus PE sub S initial is equal to negative KE final plus KE initial, distributing the negative sign through the delta there. And what do we have? Well, we've got that X final is gonna be equal to zero. X initial is equal to 0 0.12 meters. Final state of the spring is it's back at its equilibrium position when the mass leaves contact with it. Initial state is compressed by 0 0.12 meters. And then on this side, we've got ourselves that V initial, initial velocity, speed of the mass is zero, and we're trying to figure out what is the final speed. So right away, we can go ahead and get rid of a couple of these terms because the final potential energy is gonna be zero. It releases it all into the mass, and the initial kinetic energy of the mass was equal to zero because it was initially at rest. So we're left with negative delta PE sub S initial is equal to negative delta KE final, or that the initial potential energy is equal to the final kinetic energy. So from this, PE sub S initial is equal to KE final, which then gives us one half K X initial squared is equal to one half M V final squared, which we can go ahead and solve for V final pretty easily by just isolating it. And we get ourselves that V final is equal to the square root of K X initial squared divided by M. So we can go ahead and put those quantities in, and we've got ourselves 125 newtons per meter multiplied by 0 0.12 meters quantity squared divided by 0 0.5 kilograms. And what sort of final speed do we get here? Let's see. 25 times 0.2 squared divided by 0.5. All right. I get 1.897. 1.897 meters per second. Sounds good. So there we go. That's if there's no friction. Now let's go ahead and say, you know what? There is some friction in the system, and we want to know what speed does this mass leave contact with the spring in this case. So I'm going to do the same thing, basically. But say part B, now there is friction. And we're going to say that that coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.315 between the surface and 
um, the mass itself. So what do we have here now? Well, we've got a couple forces doing some work. We're going to have the spring force doing work, and we're going to have the force of friction doing work simultaneously as this mass is being pushed out to the right. So what can we do with this? Well, we just showed that we could write this out in terms of the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy and the work done by the non-conservative forces. So we have ourselves delta Ke plus delta Pe is equal to the work done by the non-conservative forces, which in this case is a kinetic friction. It's the only non-conservative force acting, and thus the change in kinetic plus the change of potential have to add it to be equal to that. What should be positive or negative? That's right, negative. We're going to lose energy, where before we had conservation of energy. All right, so what can we do with this? We can expand this all out once again. Let's just go ahead and do that. We'll write it out in terms of the deltas here first. We have a Ke final minus Ke initial plus a Pe sub S final minus a Pe sub S initial is equal to the work done by kinetic friction. And again, we are looking for what is the final speed of the mass? So we're going to have to do some work here in a sense. So just as before, we've got these same um, boundary conditions in a sense. We've got the final elongation of the spring is zero. We have the initial is 0.12 meters. We've got the initial velocity of the mass is zero. And we've got that the final velocity of the mass is what we want to figure out. So we've got those things going on for us. And then we've also got the work done by friction. And the work done by friction is going to be equal to, that's right, force of friction multiplied by the displacement times the cosine of theta. So let's just write this out. We've got the work done by friction in general is F sub k hat dot delta x hat, which can be written as F sub k delta x times the cosine of theta F sub k, where theta F sub k is the angle between the force of friction and the displacement. So I'm going to draw a little diagram here so we can see what's going on here. We've got ourselves this mass here on the surface. Yeah, the spring's going to be pushing it. And what we want to note is that there is a force of friction acting on this object, F sub k, as this object is pushed 0.12 meters. until the spring is back at its x equals zero equilibrium position. That's when the mass is going to leave the spring, and there we go. So what's the angle between F sub k and delta x? F sub k is that way, delta x is that way, thus, cos, excuse me, thus theta F sub k is equal to 180 degrees. As always is the case with friction, right? So with that, We've got our work done by friction can be written as negative F sub k delta x. And we know that F sub k, the force of kinetic friction, is equal to mu k times n. Uh, this requires recalling some things here. So we've got ourselves this. The work done by kinetic friction is equal to negative F sub k delta x, which is then equal to negative mu k n times delta x. And then it's a matter of what is n, n's the magnitude of the normal force. This object is in a horizontal surface with only the spring force pushing it horizontally, gravity pulling it down, the normal force pushes it back up, thus the normal force must be equivalent in its magnitude to the gravitational force, mg. So we've got negative mu k mg delta x. And there we go. <coughs> what else do we have? we got one other thing with this. We've got that delta x is equivalent, again, to, well, x initial. Anyways, we know what delta x is. We know the initial compression state of the spring. We've got all this stuff right here. So with respect to the final state of the spring being um, well, back at equilibrium, we've got that Pe sub s final 
is equal to zero, it stores no energy in its final state. And we've got that the initial kinetic energy of the system was equal to zero. So that's equal to zero because the object was initially at rest. Thus we have the final kinetic energy minus the initial potential energy must be equal to the work done by friction. So let's write that all out where the work done by friction is this right here. We've got ourselves then from this that one half mv final squared minus one half kx initial squared must be equal to negative mu kmg delta x. I'll expand it out. What do we want to solve for? V final. Do we know everything else? Sure, we know the mass, we know the spring constant, we know x initial, we know the coefficient of kinetic friction, we know delta x, we know g, we know g, everything. So let us just go ahead and isolate all this stuff. We could go ahead and multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of this 1 half factor. And then I can go ahead and add kx initial squared to both sides. And then we can divide by m. We can take the square root of all that. And we've got ourselves a nice expression. So I'm going to just go ahead and do this. We've got ourselves that v final is equal to the square root of negative 2 mu k mg delta x plus k x initial squared divided by m. There we go. And again, this 2 comes from multiplying both sides by 2 to get rid of this term right here. Boom, boom. Throw everything else over there, and we are in good shape. So we can go ahead and evaluate this. We've got ourselves that this will be the square root of negative 2 times 0 0.315 multiplied by the mass of 0 0.5 kilograms times g times delta x, which was 0 0.12 meters, this is going to get long, plus k, which was 125 newtons per meter, per meter, multiplied by x initial, which was 0 0.12 meters, x initial squared, so that's quantity squared, divided by the mass, whoosh, which is 0 0.5 kilograms. So, before we computate this, question, are we going to come out with the same number, something higher, something lower? And hopefully your answer is, well, it should be something lower, right? Friction took energy away from the system, which should result in less kinetic energy than we started with in terms of potential energy. And that's exactly what's going to be the case here. It's take me a second to put in the calculator, but let's just do this. Careful with some parentheses here. 125 times 1, 2 squared minus 2 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 9.8 times 0.12 all divided by 0.5. I get 1.691. Ooh. 1.691 meters per second, which is less than this. Is it a whole bunch less? No. Frictional aid was acting over 12 centimeters. So it didn't do a whole bunch of work, but it did some, and it took some of the energy away. And that's it. So whenever we've got ourselves conservative and non-conservative forces acting, we can just go ahead and utilize this. Figure stuff out. Great. All right. We'll come back with another problem here.